Hello, and welcome to Saverin's Newbie Convention Organizer's Guide. So, you really think you want to start a convention? This is a terrible idea, but in this paper I will lead misguided souls who wish to walk this path through the steps one will need to take to get a convention from a dream into nightmarish reality. This will cover the establishment of a business entity, building the event, and the execution thereof. This will be more general to the United States, but is probably broadly applicable to other regions. This also assumes you're in a metropolitan area with other conventions going on. Smaller, rural events are easier to manage expectations on, but won't really be covered as my experiences are working within the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex in Texas. Pulling off a small meetup type event is a lot easier in theory, but the steps mentioned here are still things to consider. The basics. Before we can get started, there is an extremely important series of questions I have to ask. Are you an adult? Do you have full-time gainful employment? Do you have at least $10,000 liquid that you can throw at problems without losing your home or apartment? Do you know the conventions are not a way to make money, especially starting out? Are you prepared to go into severe debt if your event doesn't go as planned? If you answered no to any of these, you really should go volunteer at a local event instead. Another very important question is, if you have a partner, are they okay with the potential financial burden starting up an event of this nature requires, or the potential debt you may accrue if things do not go as planned? It's not just the time commitment, but also putting your family's finances at risk. Now that we have this bit of information out of the way, the next steps are a name, organizing as a discrete entity like an LLC, loads of online and in-person research, and a year or more of lead time. Having a good evocative event name isn't really that simple sometimes, but it's probably the easiest thing in the beginning. Find a name you like and Google that. Find out if other events share that name and reconsider your pick if so. Find out what events in your genre are generally named. Think you've got a winner? Grab those URLs. .com if possible, .net and .org if you can. Avoid uncommon top-level domains, as they're usually more expensive and most people aren't going to remember .top or .zone as easily as .com. Redirect them all to the same place for your eventual convention website and hire or find someone to build it. Create social media accounts and be prepared to use them heavily. Twitter and Facebook are awful websites for your mental health, but needed for the promotion they enable. Make an Instagram account if you want. Just make sure you secure your chosen name across these things, because someone getting a hold of an account with your event's name on it can become a major problem. The next step is vitally important to your own financial health. Do not, under any, any, any circumstances, do this as a sole proprietor. If you do this, your financial future will be in serious jeopardy. Being an LLC shields you as the con-chairman from being financially liable in most cases if things really go sideways. A quick search will tell you that the average cost of filing is around $100, and a lot of states have an annual fee. Nevada is the most expensive at $450 to file, while California has the highest annual fee of $820. The bottom line being if you can't drop the money to form an LLC, you really have no business trying to organize a convention. You can also look at forming a 501c3 or c7 nonprofit, which will fulfill a similar role, but is a lot more involved. Also, find yourself a business lawyer and keep them on speed dial. You will likely need their assistance. Market research will be critical for your success, because accidentally setting your new event on the same weekend as another more established one in your area is very ill-advised. No matter what genre of convention you're keen on starting, odds are you'll be sharing a region with many other events that are much more established. Looking within 50 miles of your area should give you an idea of what general events are occurring that might conflict with your idea. After one has done this, you also need to look at conventions that are within your genre. Anime, sci-fi, furry, Doctor Who, steampunk, brony, and just general geek cons also have their own ecosystems on a national scale you should look into. Keep in mind that a lot of attendees at these types of conventions cross over between them, so if you're starting a furry convention and there's an anime convention on your weekend, it's going to hurt your attendance. If you're going to try and slot into one of these genres, you'll also need to know what weekends are occupied and try to find a gap in the calendar. You also need to be aware of the timings of school starting, local college midterms, and finals weeks as those will also cost you potential attendees. Also, if you live in a location where you have a weather season, avoid it as well, as this can cause issues with flights. For example, if you're in New England, avoid the dead of winter. In Texas or the Southwest, the peak of summer. If you're in Florida, avoid hurricane season. Insurance companies call these acts of God, but in this case, God is predictable. Best to stay out of the way. The next step, if you finish looking at your calendar and thought, perhaps this weekend will work, is to assess the health of the genre you're going to be sliding into. Look at the attendance of local conventions in your area, if you can find that information, and see if they are growing. 
Look at conventions in your genre. Are they shrinking? Are they shutting down? If so, maybe you really should reconsider. Established events going dark generally indicate it's not a great time for a new one to appear to take its place. Part of having at least a year of lead time is to get a longer view of things in your chosen genre. While you're doing this, you will also need to network, network, network. You're just one person, and you'll need a lot of assistance to get an event going. You're going to want to find about a dozen people with some experience as an absolute minimum to help at the start, before expanding to at least 30 before the event. Find a local meetup group, a local Facebook group. Talk to local colleges and see if they've got people looking to start up an event. The best way to find these people, however, is to volunteer at another local convention and meet people actively involved in the convention scene. Most convention staff work multiple events, and if you have a good vision, they might be willing to help you out too. You'll need operations staff who make sure things are set up, people who can run event security, some people with first aid knowledge, AV crew, staff artists, VIP relations, department leads to oversee things like gaming, registration, and vendor relations, among others. A brief aside on staff acquisition at this point. Once you've tapped people for lead positions, you can delegate departmental staff acquisition to that department. It's still important to vet higher-ups, but odds are if you can get someone for a department, that person will know others who might be able to help. This is where I'll stop again and ask you, do you really want to do this? You're looking at taking on another full-time job, with no pay, incredible stress, little recognition, losing friendships, and the practically guaranteed reality of random people shouting death threats your way. If so, let's continue. Building a convention. Now that you've done your legwork and found what you think might be a good weekend to plan an event is to begin looking at local places you might hold said event in. If you're extremely lucky and found a college group, you might be able to hold an event on campus at minimal cost to you. You probably didn't though, so the next best thing is to contact a meeting procurement firm like Helms Briscoe. They bill themselves as the global leader in meetings procurement, and my personal experiences with them have been stellar. There are other meeting procurement groups out there like Experient, but I haven't had any experience with them myself. Be prepared to do a lot of research into which group to work with. Using a meeting procurement company actually makes the finding a place to have our convention step relatively easy, but it's also important it occurs relatively early within your year plus of lead time. Finding an event space on your preferred weekend or those around it is a hell of a lot easier when you've offloaded the work to an experienced company. This is about the only time you'll get to do that, so savor it. You let them know what your general budget is and they contact spaces in your region for bids on the weekend you're looking for and those around it. You'll hopefully get a few options as bids come in and can proceed from there. Just be aware that in a lot of cases that once you sign the contract, you'll owe 25% of the quoted space rental cost plus potentially any food and beverage minimums and room block attrition to the hotel, regardless of you actually running the event or not. This slowly increases the closer you are to the event, hitting 100% at 30 days out. You may also owe a deposit at the 30 day out point, though it varies. This is the point of business no return. The amount of money in play here is significant. An example from last year is an under 350 room night rental cost of $11,250 for the space we used. Even with over 450 room nights, the rental was still $5,250. There was a food and beverage minimum of $2,500 owed either way, either by us using banquet services or just paying it. These figures also didn't include the 23% service charge on everything, 8.25% sales tax on food, or 6% occupancy tax on the rooms themselves. Attrition is another issue, as in this case the contract required us to fulfill 85% of our room block at minimum to not incur attrition costs. This fee is calculated as the difference between 85% of the block and the actual block of rooms consumed, along with the difference in the minimum revenue requirements and the actual food, beverage, and meeting room rental revenue. The example in the contract was if the group's contracted block is 385 room nights cumulative, 85% attrition responsibility would be 327 room nights. If the group only picks up 300 rooms, which is 27 rooms less than the required attrition, then the group would be responsible for $2,943 plus 13% tax along with a meeting room rental of $11,250 plus service charge and applicable sales tax. If you don't feel like doing the math, that's a bill of $18,091 once the taxes and fees are figured in. And that is for an event that didn't meet the room night requirements and thus probably didn't have too many attendees either. In this situation, you end up paying more the worse you do. While this is going on, since it'll take a while, you're going to need to brainstorm guests. 
This is a very tricky area, and honestly you're going to be far better off finding popular people in your genre when starting out than any sort of celebrity. Guests like a fandom band, popular podcasters, cosplayers, writers, artists, the local Rocky Horror troupe, prop collectors, things like that. If they're local, it might not be too much of an investment to bring them on board as guests. Also, consider what other events in your genre are doing. If most conventions in your genre don't typically have a ton of guests, you probably shouldn't either. Also, as the convention's chair, you should have final say on guests, especially when there is money involved. Many conventions, even older established ones, have had issues where a lead has spoken out of turn and promised things they shouldn't have to a lot more people than you can realistically afford. A new event suddenly getting a dozen or more guests promised flights and rooms, if not appearance fees, will absolutely destroy your budget and your event's future. Be realistic with your expectations. One fandom-level guest can cost upwards of $2,000 just in flights, hotels, and food costs. Active voice actors will be in the several thousand to tens of thousands range, and active film or television actors much higher than that. And we haven't even gotten to registration income yet. So far, this is all out of your pocket personally if there is anything due at signing and not a 50% 30 days out, 50% on-site deal. It's generally a good idea to plan as though that's always going to be the case. You're going to need firm dates in a venue before any sort of contractual work can be done, but knowing who is who for potential guests in your area is very important. This is also another area that networking with local Facebook or meetup groups will be useful, as it can get you in contact with these parties a lot faster than Googling them. Being on good terms with your local scene is vitally important when starting something like a convention up. People talk, and a bad first impression will possibly severely limit your options. Now that you have an LLC or 501c and are really committed, you'll need a bank account. For love of all that is good and holy, do not commingle your personal money and the convention's money ever. Keep things separated and it'll make your eventual dealings with the IRS come tax time a lot less scary. The only time you should move money between personal and convention is if it's from your own pockets to the convention's coffers. Business bank accounts can be created fairly simply, but may require initial deposits of your personal money to open. Business savings and business checking are both advisable, keeping most of your funds in savings until you know you're going to need it. It limits the short-term potential impact in the event of a card being compromised. Once these are established, you can think about how you're going to take in money. Are you going to take PayPal? You'll need to establish a business PayPal account. There are many stories of PayPal freezing funds for any reason under the sun, so you'll need to transfer money out of PayPal and into your bank accounts on a regular basis. Keep a few hundred in there to handle refunds as needed, but don't keep any significant amount of money in their hands. Also, get two or three bank cards if possible. Not that I'm speaking from personal experience, but it's totally possible for you or a trusted individual to forget their debit card in an ATM over the convention weekend while on a bank run. This next portion is the convention point of no return. Up until now, it's been all networking and back-end work, establishing a business entity to build your event on, and assembling a staff. But once you have pre-reg available on your website, something is going to need to happen. Companies like Eventbrite or Eventzilla handle online ticket sales, but they also attach additional costs to your attendees. There isn't a way around this, but it will be something to consider on your pricing. You'll need to look at other events in your genre and see what the prevailing badge rate is. Pricing yourself in line with other local events is key, and will help you get a realistic budget. Take your badge price, multiply it by two-thirds of your projected ideal attendee numbers, and that'll give you a ballpark number to aim for budget-wise. Being conservative with your spending, especially at the beginning, will help you in the long run. Marketing past this point will be the life or death of your event. You did remember to make that social media business, right? Getting the word out of your new event is achievable in a number of ways. Facebook and Twitter, as awful as they are, are going to be key component outside of marketing at other events. Unfortunately for us, this also means money to Facebook and Twitter to boost your posts. If you're working in a fandom, emailing press releases to websites may help if they're the sort that will post about new events, though this will probably result in quid pro quo requests from that site. Interested fandom media generally will promote you if you toss a badge or two their way. This will also hopefully attract interested fans to your social media, and engaging with them can also spread your word out in their circles. Marketing in events is also an important avenue once you've gotten some promotional material together. Unfortunately, some established conventions require you having run a few times before they'll allow you to have a promotional table due to the high rate of flameout on new events. Flyers with initial guest lineups, dates, and locations can get printed somewhat inexpensively in the several thousand range at local shops. You'll just need to search for what commercial print services are in your area. Sometimes you can get your local geek spaces to let you set up flyers on their tables, but this is becoming a lot less common, at least in my personal experience around DFW. 
Next is something you've probably not thought much about. Music licensing is something that event organizers will have to contend with and isn't actually much of an outlay. BMI and ASCAP are the two main licensors of music in the US, and paying a license fee will set you back around $300 for both for a convention just starting out. This covers you, for example, if you have a dance and the DJ uses remixes of current pop music, some jerk rolls through with a speaker on their costume, or an inconsiderate vendor decides that playing music in their booth is a good idea. Public performance of audio is something that falls on the event operator and not the venue, so keeping the music industry off your back is a good idea. A small outlay here can save you a lot of money in the long run. After this is event insurance. Most venues and AV rental companies won't contract with you until you have it, or can provide it before the event date. In my experience, you must have your invoice paid and a copy of the AV rental company as additional insured before they'll load your rented equipment on the truck. So be sure to know what insurance requirements are attached to your rental companies. You can find various event insurance companies with a quick search, and this can run you between $400 to $800, at least in my experience. Be aware of the limitations on your insurance, though, since there are a surprisingly broad range of things that are prohibited or just not covered without additional insurance coverage. This includes things like stunt shows, precision driving, pyrotechnics, mechanical bulls, bounce houses, and things like live rock or rap shows. You probably won't have those at your event, but be sure to read the fine print. Purchasing is something that you as chair will likely be handling, and I hope you have Amazon Prime. If you don't, get it. There are a million little things you'll need to buy ahead of time and store at your place. And closer to the event, you may need something quick and you will not have the time to drive around to multiple stores to look for it. Sometimes you won't have time to go to even one store, but opening an app and clicking buy and getting it two days or less later, you can do that while taking a poop between answering your millions of unending emails. Things like golf pencils and note cards for panels, hand sanitizer, lanyards, Tyvek wristbands if you aren't doing printed badges, badge blanks and printer cartridges for badge printers if you're renting them, paper clips and envelopes for cash office, a cash box, gaffer tape, safety cables, paper, the list is really long. You're going to forget something for sure, so I hope you have a big box retailer near your venue to send people on last minute runs to grab. Also, you'll need things like bottled water in bulk, snacky things to keep your staff and volunteers going while on duty, green room stuff if you have guests, things like that. Let your department leads tell you what they need and do your best to provide it. Delegating any last second purchasing during convention to a trusted second is ideal, and another good reason to have acquired a second or third business debit card back during the bank setup phase. As an extension of purchasing, getting an event shirt is often fairly baseline to an event. Per unit costs on the small scale are around 5 to 7 per shirt for around 6 color printing. Get your staff artist to put together a shirt design for you and shop around for business to business shirt printers. You can go to commercial shops that do this, but the unit cost will be much higher. If you're expecting a thousand people, get maybe 100 shirts. If you overpurchase, they will haunt your storage space forever. I was at a recent event where on Sunday they announced that their event shirts were on sale for just $10, which wasn't too much over cost, and that they only had 300 left. At the end of the day, they were giving those shirts away to the vendors. This can be a real money sink for new events. Convention books are also going to run you in the ballpark of $1 to $2 per book, if you're intent on having them. But if you're spending less than $3,500 a year on books, you'll still be better off with them to start than an online scheduling service. Downside to this is events that are on the schedule can change in between time of printing to them being in the hands of your attendees. But that's what Google Calendar, room schedule signage, and social media updates are for when you're running lean early on. None of these options is perfect and people are going to complain regardless. So just do your best to communicate any changes. Up until now, everything has been on the business side of things. But this next section will bring up more ethical concerns. Your code of conduct is important because a lot of people want to know the character of the event they're attending as much as the events going on during the convention. Having what is and isn't allowed on paper before the con covers your butt when it comes down to any sort of enforcement action. Comprehensive anti-harassment policies that are enforced are extremely important. The good news is that many events post their own policies publicly and often encourage other conventions to assess and adopt provisions from there. Look at the conventions in your region and see how they roll as well as larger events in your fandom space. You want an event that everyone can feel comfortable attending, so curtailing poor behavior via policy and then enforcement is extremely important. This ties back to email and social media, as people will contact you before con to provide information on potentially problematic attendees you should be aware of and during for things that pop up during the event. Be prepared to personally deal with extremely upset people in a professional and not dismissive manner, and to take their concerns seriously. 
make sure your con security team is on board with this as well. It's not fun to deal with, but it will show you're serious about curtailing bad behavior and ensuring a good convention experience. It's the right thing to do, and is nothing but a boon to your reputation going forward. Panels are another area that will reflect on the convention's reputation. As chair, you should be aware of the type of panels submitted and approved to run at your convention. There are a lot of easy gets, like Cosplay 101, Drawing Tutorials, or Introduction to Fan Voice Acting, but try to take some time and look into panels that seem fishy. Panels that denigrate or tear down other fans' OC or works are generally not the greatest. Be willing to contact potential panelists if you have questions about their submissions, and ask if there are panel recordings from other events you can skim. Edgy kids beget more edgy kids in the future, so limit their infestation early. The Execution So far, this all seems like a lot of work, right? We haven't even gotten to crunch and the event itself, let alone the aftermath. Crunch time is the period starting around 60 days before the convention itself. You've gotten things going this far, you've been bringing in some money, been able to hopefully block off funds to pay for some things before the convention, and acquired more staff and volunteers. At 60 days out, you're going to want to have the skeleton of your con book going minus the schedule, your vendors being all paid up to you, art assets solidified and ready, guest contracts signed, and maybe a will ready in case the stress does you in. I might be joking about that last bit, but having a will is a good idea regardless. 30 days out is the true crunch time. That's generally when any guest with appearance fees will need their 50% up front, as well as their flights more or less picked out if you're the one choosing them. This is also the point of no return with venues, since cancellations at this point mean you'll owe 100% to the venue regardless if you run or not. You'll need your shirt orders in, your con books practically ready to go, any signage or banners printed and delivered, event insurance paid up, and it might be time to look at badge printing. You're going to need to solidify who has a car, who can drive, and who will be picking people up from the airport. You'll also have to lock in room layouts at your venue if you haven't already. You might also owe an upfront portion of your venue rental costs, though a lot of events will let you wait and pay until after the event if things seem to be going well on their side. This is also when the second full-time job aspect of being a con chair comes into play. It will begin to consume your life from now until weeks after the convention concludes. Expect to be on the phone, answering emails, and responding on social media in any spare moments. Tell your partner you love them, because you're going to be a bit busy for the next 45 days. In the week before the convention, you'll have to have paid any AV rental costs, secured any rental trucks, organized the pickup of said AV equipment, picked up any borrowed or rented equipment from other conventions, acquired your starting stash of snack supplies, picked up shirts and con books if you have them, organized pickup for any staff arriving at airports, and handled the inevitable fires that pop up last second. Wednesday before your convention is generally day negative one. Last second fires will pop up, and you'll get to deal with those in addition to any last second coordination to make sure everything and everyone gets to your venue in one piece. You'll also need to have acquired any cash funds you'll need for the weekend, since you'll owe the back 50% of appearance fees and per DM to any guests owed them tomorrow, as well as any operational cash or registration and the like. This is the last day you're going to get much sleep, probably. Thursday is day zero. Thursday is the day you'll move into the space once it's available, moving all your gear into the convention operations room, getting your AV gear and everything else set up like registration, main events, and vendor hall. All of your events rooms are going to be set up today. Good thing you have a staff, right? You're going to have to trust your team at this point, because you are one person and have to be able to lead, but also be willing to step back and let your people get to it. Your guests, if you have them, will likely be flying in today, and when they're on site you'll need to have your cash officer disperse the money they're owed to their agent or the guests themselves. You'll also need to make sure your vendor lead has whatever they need so they can get the vendors in and ready. You'll need to communicate any setup issues to your hotel event coordinator, and get everything as set up as possible for the first day of the convention tomorrow. Resist the urge to drink. Get a little sleep. Tomorrow's the big day. The convention itself is going to be a whirlwind. You'll be on your feet 18 hours a day if you're lucky, and trusting your team to handle minor issues is important, because there's going to be a million little things that pop up and you're not going to have the bandwidth to handle it all. Did a guest go off site and not tell you? Did a mom show up with her kid and not get a badge for herself? Did someone honestly show up with an erotic cosplay at a PG convention about cartoon horses? Did someone just walk up and insult or creep on one of your paid guests and now they're threatening to leave if you don't do something about it right now? These will be things you as chair will have to deal with, calls you'll have to make. Sometimes these are things someone else is really equipped to handle, but you, as the authority and face of the con, will need to personally handle for sake of appearance and PR. This is a big group event, but you're the one who started this mess, so the buck stops with you. 
You'll need to speak publicly at opening ceremonies, possibly during a Your First Convention panel, and make appearances at things when needed. Beyond that, though, you're going to be on the convention floor fixing problems as they pop up. Hopefully, you will have backup in the form of a vice chair, second, or co-chairman to split the load and be in charge if you're off-site or asleep. Some cons have an executive officer system that rotates who is in charge among department leads if the chair isn't available. I had a co-chairman with my event, and we swapped off so that one of us could take a meal break as needed or to run off-site if it demanded we do so personally. It made our lives much easier. If you can get four to five hours of sleep a night this weekend, you'll be doing good. Don't forget to eat. Seriously. Hopefully, if you've planned things well, not overspent, and didn't accidentally burn down your venue, you will have survived until Sunday afternoon, which is when conventions generally wind down. You'll hopefully have good news to announce at closing ceremonies about attendance, about your hopes for next year, and the money you've raised for your charity, if any. You'll get to thank your staff, guests, vendors, and attendees for a fun, for them, weekend. Hopefully. At this point, you're going to be utterly exhausted and still nowhere near done. Everything you did Thursday gets to be done in reverse now. Guests go back home, vendors pack out, AV tears down, and preps for transport back to the rental companies. Some of your staff head home, and you've got the rest of this evening and part of tomorrow to get things back in order. You can at least hope to get a little sleep tonight, though you'll need to be up early tomorrow to get your cash to the bank. Generally, you burn through supplies, so you'll have a little less stuff to transport back to your home, but it's still going to take up a lot of space for a little while longer. After this, it's a waiting game for a little bit. If you use the card processing company, it'll take a day or two for everything to filter into your accounts. You'll get nickeled and dimed here and there from your AV company, probably, since maybe one of your techs forgot a cable somewhere. Maybe they dinged up the rental truck. Lots of piddly little charges will fly your way after the convention weekend, and you likely won't even get the hotel bill for a week or more after the convention weekend ends. While you're settling everything back down to its pre-convention state, as well as possibly dealing with con crud, you're also getting to wait on the hotel bill while you know exactly what is left in your convention bank account, hoping to God that the former is smaller than the latter. After everything is said and done, and the bill comes in, and you're able to pay the hotel bill without digging into your own pockets, the question will then be, do I want to do this again? Give yourself time to think about that. Talk to your partner. Look at your health. Look at the time investment you've dropped and the money left over for a theoretical second run after all the bills are paid. At this point, you'll have gone through the crucible of convention leadership and will generally have one of two reactions. You'll either want to do it all again or never want to touch a leadership role in a convention ever again. Wrapping up. If you've read or listened this far, thank you. Please understand that everything I wrote and said here is based on personal experience over a decade. It is no small feat to pull this off, but it will take a large mental toll over time. This is but a speedrun version of all the nonsense you have to deal with as a convention organizer without even touching many of the departments you'll have to delegate as a leader. I heavily suggest you spend a lot of time volunteering at local events to get a feel for how things need to go and work within those events. Starting something new is incredibly hard and potentially disastrous so getting experience before any attempt is absolutely vital. Fandom is a very exciting space to be in, and it's natural to want to give back. But starting a convention is not something to be done lightly. I hope this has been educational and also gives you a fresh appreciation for those of us that work within existing conventions and some of the work that we do. I'd also like to thank Jade, Shiva, Path, and Tempo for their input while I was writing this. Their insight was extremely helpful in fleshing this out. Please let me know what you think, and thank you for listening.